real joy for me to be here and to uh, be able to just share with you because I was mentioning I, this summer sometime I was thinking, you know, I just got to go over to Lawrence. It's not that far. I mean, actually, we're about 30 minutes away because we live on the west side of Olathe there. So it's, it's just not that far and nice drive on uh, country roads for the most part. And uh, we just kind of make our way over here easily. But uh, so good to see the church so vibrant and so alive and so, uh, so full. Anxious to meet more of you. I've met some of the oldies and the goldies, I guess, uh, from years past when we were here, and that's been a wonderful thing as well. Just a word to say to you, uh, just a little um, greeting from Mid America, um, where things I feel like are in wonderful ways these days, and God is moving among us. He's trusting us with more and more students. Uh, we have the largest uh, class of incoming ministry majors that we've had, uh, I, I don't remember when. I mean, it's over 10 years at least. And what a wonderful group uh, of young men and women who are uh, looking at the possibility of being in a ministry vocation of some sort. And uh, they're, they're, they're amazing to, to get to know and to uh, see their passion, their love for God. and. Uh, the other things uh, we just noticed, we just came off a homecoming weekend here and many uh, people returned and, and it was a wonderful time of kind of once again reconnecting and seeing God's movement and how he's worked over the years among us. And uh, we buried a, a little uh, time capsule in the center of campus to be opened up in the year uh, 2066, which will be the 100 year anniversary and uh, we were all invited to come back for that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, fortunately, my 13-year-old grandson was there, and we took a picture of him beside that, and by God's grace, I hope he's there on that day. I'm pretty sure I won't be, but uh, that'll be exciting, I'm, I'm sure. Um, and just uh, also then to say a word about uh, Bob and Diana and uh, the whole Giffen family. Uh, we've learned to love them, and uh, as uh, Robbie was telling you, it goes way back to Topeka days when they were just little kids throwing rocks, I guess. I don't know. I didn't, ever, I didn't realize that happened, but it uh, might have. Uh, but just down the road there, and we got to meet them there in, in the great Topeka Paralon Church. My parents were there for, I think, 39 years. Uh, that was after they moved from Lawrence uh, over to Topeka. And uh, just, uh, yeah, they, they really invested their lives deeply. And my, <clears throat> my dad became a Christian at that point in time. As they made that transition, I couldn't tell you the, the day or the time, but I can tell you the moment when he prayed a prayer at our meal. First time I'd ever heard my dad pray was an amazing experience. Because for years, that was not his way of life. And he was not, he did not join us while we were here in Lawrence uh, very often for church. But God did work in, uh, in his heart. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that a little bit later. Well, it is a, a time of uh, transition, I know, in these days. Pastoral transitions are interesting times. Uh, I know a little bit about it, although I was just a teenager when I was here. We had four pastors in the nine years I was here. <laughs> That's kind of the way we did it back in those days. We'd keep somebody for about two or three years, and then they'd move on. And uh, that was kind of the, the way it happened. But uh, <clears throat> uh, I know that it's a time where you kind of rethink, you know, who are we as a church? You know, what, what is our mission what, what is our character as a church? And, and that's, that's good. We need to be thinking about that and reflecting on that. It gives us pause to kind of rethink. And so, you know, what is it God has for us? What is our mission here in this place, in this time, in these days? And uh, it reminded me then also of a time, very similar questions being asked of people in the Bible way, way back in the time of even Moses. And in the book of Exodus, we read about how uh, a major moment in time came about in the 19th chapter of, of Exodus, where after they had, Israelites had been delivered from their slavery in Egypt, 
and been uh, miraculously brought across the, uh, the Red Sea and then into the wilderness and been fed in a miraculous way. They came to a mountain at a moment in time when God is forming them into a community of faith and really helping them to understand what does that mean to be a community of faith? What does God envision for his people? So I'd like to read to you, if you will, from the uh, 19th chapter of Exodus and verses 1 through 6. And would you like to stand for the reading of God's word as we uh, read it together here? So I'm reading from the New New Living Translation. Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking camp at Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have been what I did, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me, keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. This is God's word. You may be seated. You'll notice three very distinguishing characteristics that God identifies that his people would be. And I think there are kinds of uh, characteristics that we as a people today, people of God today, would want to adopt and to live into as well. The first one here is that favored status. I like this one. This is the best, isn't it? Where God says, you will be my special treasure, my special possession, the most valued thing that God owns. You and me, the most valued thing that God owns in this world. Uh, The term there that's that's translated special treasure is a a Hebrew word that has a very special meaning, very significant meaning here. And uh, sometimes in my classes, I like to uh, have my uh, students uh, work on their Hebrew because I'm trying to challenge them to actually get into it at some point in their life. And so the word is segula. Do you want to say that word with me? Uh, Can we try that one? Segula. There you go. There's your Hebrew lesson for today, segula. Remember that word. It means a special treasure, a special possession. And that is a term that's used several times in the Bible for God to talk about his people, but it's also used to talk about that special kind of treasure that the king had. You see, theoretically, the king in ancient Israel owned everything. I mean, he, you know, he was the king. So everyone was his subject, all the land was his. But he did have his own special possessions, the things that he owned. And Chronicles tells us that when they were gathering all the different kinds of gifts for the temple and getting ready to build it together during the time of David, that David gave his segula to the temple so that it could be built. His, out of his own personal possessions, he gave. Well, I don't know if we can fully grasp all that God is trying to say to us here when he says, you are his treasured possession or his special possession. But I I think a little bit of of some of the friends that my parents did have in Topeka there. And uh, uh, Robbie would know the the Stearmans. uh, They were some of my parents' very best friends. And Dwayne and Mary um, lived on a little place not too far from us, actually on the north side of Topeka there. And I like to go over to the house, especially when uh, Dwayne would take us out to his garage. And out in his garage, he would have what I think was a treasured possession. Pull back that door, and there it was, 
the Model T Ford. That thing shined. I mean, I don't think there was ever a speck of dust on it. It looked better than it looked the day it rolled off of the assembly line, I'm pretty sure. It was a special possession for the Stearmans. We are God's favorite people. You know, um, some of the years uh, while we were in seminary, my wife and I trained in personal evangelism. And one of the things when you're talking to somebody about, you know, how to become a Christian, uh, often you might say to them, a kind of a line we learned was to say, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And my wife always liked to add, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> but that's really a, a great statement, isn't it? It's actually a statement you could say as well. God loves you but I'm his favorite. And you know what? You are his favorite also. You say, I don't understand. How could that be? I mean, one of us has got to be the favorite and another one's not the favorite, right? Is that how it's going to be? Well, not exactly. I, I didn't really kind of grasp this entirely until several years ago now when my uh, aunt passed away, Aunt Millie. And she, she was a wonderful lady who never married. She uh, gave her life to the Lord and, and uh, was a missionary out in the Appalachian Mountains of the uh, eastern part of uh, the United States in Kentucky. And uh, she would come back ever so often. And then finally in the latter years, she came back to take care of my grandma in her older years. And she was just there. Well, it came time <coughs> when she passed. And um, they asked me to say a few words at the... Uh, at the service and as I began to reflect on it a little bit I got to thinking you know I think about out of all the grandkids uh, all of her nieces and nephews which there are 19 of us I I'm surely her favorite <laughs> because you know the way we had these conversations and, and the, the way she made me feel when we were together and how we things we talked about together and of course I was the preacher boy I mean you know I mean that had to be something right so I was pretty sure I was Aunt Millie's favorite. And then I got to talking to my cousin Nancy. <laughs> and she said, you know what, I think I was her favorite. And then she went on to say, but you know what, we were all her favorite. And we were. All 19 of us, nieces and nephews, in some way were very special to Aunt Millie. She found something in us that was significant and special and unique and set us apart, and we were indeed her very favorite for that reason. I think I began to understand a little bit because, you know, I've got three kids. My oldest daughter is my favorite, as is my second daughter my favorite, as is my son my favorite. And don't get me started on the six grandkids. <laughs> Every one of them is a favorite. They are outstanding. And your heart just kind of grows, doesn't it? And this is the great heart of God who every one of us, we are his favorite. In uh, 1963 of November, actually it was just after John F. Kennedy had been shot, my family moved to 2009 Massachusetts Street. If you think about where that might be, you will be aware of the fact that it's just right across the street from the old location of Lawrence First Church. Well, we uh, showed up on the first uh, day of December, I guess it was, first Sunday of December. Just walked across the street. My, uh, my mom said, you know, I, I don't know a whole lot about the Nazarene Church. Uh, we were United Brethren in, in Leavenworth. We'd gone to this little tiny church, about 30 people, United Brethren Church. And uh, she said, I know a lady, though, in, in Loveworth, who's a Nazarene, she was a really wonderful lady. So why don't we just go over there and see what's, what's over there? And then we can check out some other churches along the way. We never checked out any other church. We never went anywhere where else. I mean, we were just almost sucked in to Lawrence First Church. The people were so inviting and so made us feel special, like we were, in fact, God's favorite when we came in those doors. And that was the kind of the feeling we had the whole time we were there. Like we were God's special people 
as we were a part of the, that group of people. You know, in 1935, my, my mother's house burned down to the ground. She lived out on a farm up here in Lovemorth, Kansas. And uh, it would have been one of those really, really hot summers, uh, like over 30 days of 100 degree weather. So the wells had dried up and when the, f when the neighbors came to try to help to put out the fire, the well went dry really fast. And we, my mom says that we just stood back and watched it burn to the ground. Uh, they did something in those days that's not recommended uh, at all. But uh, while it was burning, they ran back into the house to grab stuff out and, and pull it out because they knew they couldn't save the house. So they just began to pull stuff out. And I thought about that. If, if I would run back into a house, what, what would I run into a burning house to save? What would I make sure? What would be the special possession that I would grab? What would be the thing that you would grab? Probably be a person, wouldn't it? It would be that special possession. God ran into a burning world and risked his very life to rescue you and to rescue me. We are his treasured possession. We are his favorites. That's who we are first and foremost as the people of God. But you notice also, he says that we're a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. So we not only have a favored status, but we also have a very meaningful mission in life, a great purpose to be a kingdom of priests. You say, I don't get that one. I mean, does that mean we're all supposed to wear robes and stuff and kind of, you know, perform rituals and baptisms and, you know, serve communion and all that kind of stuff? Well, that's not, that's not what God's talking about here exactly. I mean, their priests did wear special robes and stuff like that and did that kind of stuff. But God's saying, I want you all to be priests. And what does that mean? Well, what's a priest do? They stand in the gap. They stand between God and they stand between people. And they draw God to people and people to God and try to pull them together. They represent God to the people around them. And then they turn and represent the people to God and stand in that gap. And that's what it means to be a priest for God. And in fact, this is what God has called us to be. To be, if you will, worship leaders. People who are out there honoring God and worshiping God and showing God to other folks while also showing God to the folks around them. That's our mission. You know, at the end of this month here, uh, there'll be the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. The Reformation is a time when uh, a group of, of people, there was a movement of people that began to feel like the constraints of the church that were happening in, in Europe in those days were not exactly on track as to where God wanted it to be. And so they protested. And so the Protestants kind of emerged out of that. And we're marking this 500th anniversary with a a momentous moment when a guy by the name of Martin Luther nailed uh, 95 discussion topics to a church to say, we need to talk about these things, about the kinds of ways in which the priesthood is kind of disconnected from real life. And one of the key things, there's a lot to this whole movement of, of people, and don't, we don't have time to talk about it all, but one of the key things that came out of that is the call for every believer to be a priest, the priesthood of all believers. And that is, in fact, our mission and our call. Now, that's a little difficult some days, is it not? Do you have any trouble uh, being a priest, being a person who calls others to God when somebody cuts you off in traffic? Is that hard? Can be can be a little bit difficult or when you're standing in that really long line that's just not moving you know why is it not moving why is that person not being able to get their money out of the person get you know get this thing moving along here it's a little hard to be leading other people in worship in those moments isn't it it's also a challenge challenging when somebody takes advantage of you or when you're just having a bad day i recall how the people of this church 
in the years that we were here. They're like priests to us all across the board. And I, I'm almost afraid to start listing names of the people that I, I can recall because I'm pretty sure there's some I can't remember, the Bright Ups, the Bowleys, the Hearst, the Rices. I mean, you go down the Fries, a long list, Reckheisens, all these people who were priests to my family while we were there, helping us to know God and bringing us to God. Um, one of the memories I have in particular is from the guy who was kind of the priest. He was the pastor of the church at the time, uh, a guy by the name of Bob Crew, a great pastor. And uh, he wasn't actually doing what you think in terms of being like the pastor. Because here's what happened. Um, my dad decided it was time that we needed to roof the house. Now, in our family, whenever you decide to do anything to the house or to the car, you didn't hire anybody. You did it yourself. You figured it out. He's a farm boy. He came from the farm. You just figured out you get bailing wire, you get some tools, and you, you just make it happen. You just make it, make it take place. And so that, that was my dad. And so roof the house, go down and buy some shingles. He's got two boys, teenage boys. They take us up on the roof, and every day after work and on Saturdays all day long, we would be roofing the house. And one day, one of those days, actually I think several days, Bob Krug came over, the pastor, came over and helped us roof that house because he, he had done some of that when he was in seminary, uh, just the way of, of earning his way through seminary. And I'll tell you, that really touched my dad. When, and I remember him saying, I, said, I can't believe the pastor did that for me. That was amazing. Now, th those were the days before my dad was really a Christian. He, he didn't really come very much to the church. Uh, he'd ever show up on a few special occasions along the way. But I think that was one of those moments that moved him toward God in a way that uh, would eventually bear complete fruit in his life. So I remind you today, you have a meaningful mission in life as the people of God. You're not only having that favored status with him, you're his favorite, but you're also people with a great mission, the great commission. But notice one more thing. It does say to us that we have a distinctive character also. God says, you will be my holy people, my holy people. You'll be unique, you'll be different. You'll be distinctive. You won't be like everybody else in this world. That word holy is one that sometimes kind of scares us a little bit, about like the word priest, I guess, in some ways. What do you mean calling us priests? What do you mean calling us holy? I mean, we're not sure about that one, you know. But that's a great word. It's a great word because it basically means to be different than the world is. Don't be like the rest of the world. And actually, it's being different from the rest of the world in the way that God is different. It's being like God because God is holy. And what's so different about God? What is so different about God anyway? It's the way he loves, isn't it? It's the way he loves. That's what's so different about him. That's what's so unique about God. It's the way he loves. And so what God has called us to is to be different in the way we love in this world as well. I caught a glimpse of this again when I think about my days here at Lawrence First Church. Um, a dumb teenager driving the family car down New Hampshire Street south. And at 17th, I turned the corner a little too fast, in fact, way too fast. I lost control. How do you do that? I don't know how you do that. Anyway, those were the days when it was, it, these were actually uh, brick streets at that point. And it was a little slick, so that's my only defense, but there's really none. And I lost control and I hit a parked car, a parked car. I mean, it was just sitting there. It wasn't doing anything. I hit it. Well, of course, um, called the police. The police came and the policeman had decided that maybe I should be kind of an, 
made an example of, and he was uh, wanting to really make this lesson come in really important in my life. And he was bearing down on me uh, pretty hard. And apparently on his way home from work, uh, one of the folks of the church, a guy who invested heavily in those days in this church, Roy Taylor, came along and he, uh, he saw me over there. He didn't have to stop, but he stopped. And uh, he came over and just made sure that the policeman didn't overdo his thing with me. And to just remind him that there were plenty of people up on the hill there that maybe would be much uh, more difficult kinds of people. And this boy was not one of those kind that maybe you would have to deal with there. So uh, he just came alongside of me and in love and compassion and caring. This is one of those moments I felt like God's love came through this church. Have you noticed that the older you get, the more like your parents you become? Sorry about that. <laughs> Although that's a good thing in many ways. There's some really good characteristics of our parents, aren't there? And yet there are some things, you know, we said, we'll never do that. And we do. <laughs> but our goal is to be like our Heavenly Father. That's our goal. Is to love like He loves. With the kind of love that's just absolutely a relentless love. And that's something we were just talking about this, this last Tuesday night in my small group. As we were sitting there talking about this amazing, relentless love of God. And, and we looked at this passage over in Romans that the Apostle Paul had written, obviously a person who really understood the relentless love of God. Listen to what he said. He said, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us a right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is our distinctive character. This love that does not give up. This love that keeps on keeping on. This is what God has called us to be. A holy nation. A group of people who are unique and distinctive in our love for others. Well, the following verses after what we read there in chapter 19 of Exodus tell about the response of the people of Israel. And you know what they said? They said, we'll do everything the Lord has said. We're all in. We want to be a part of this kind of community. We want to be a part of a group of people that are like this. A group of people that are, that are God's favorites and the, a group of people that, in fact, will have a, a major purpose in life, something that's really worth giving your life to a meaningful mission, and a group of people 
who love like that. that that's the kind of group. And who doesn't want to be a part of a community like that? Who doesn't want to be? You know, when we walked across the street in 1963 to Lawrence First Church, it changed my life completely. I mean, I was, we came out of a little bitty church. The United Brethren Church was a great church, great people, wonderful people. But it set me on a course of service in the Church of the Nazarene that I never, ever imagined possible. And that group of people taught me who I was. They, they taught me what my mission should life in life should be. They invited me in to be a part of that mission. And they showed me, they showed me what the love of God, that relentless love of God was truly like. Three big questions we ask in life, aren't there? What's my value? Does anyone really value me? And what's my mission? What is my purpose in life? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? And then the question of how should I, how should I live? What, what characterizes me as an individual? But those are the same three great questions that a church in transition might be asking themselves too, right? We need to ask ourselves, so what is our value here on this corner? What, what is it that is our mission? What is God's mission for us? And how should we live? My challenge to you today is to continue to be that church. That church that knows it's God's special possession. That church that in fact is a kingdom of priests and is a holy nation. You are God's favorite people with a meaningful mission and a distinctive character. I invite the worship team.